The route which led the major powers of Europe to war in 1914 was long and torturous, with many factors driving them to armed conflict. Perhaps the most important and obvious was the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. That limited confrontation had seen the humiliating defeat of France and the unification of the German states under Prussian leadership. The sudden emergence of the German Empire which as part of the spoils of victory took the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine from France, brought about a fundamental shift in the European balance of power. Germany's accelerated progress towards economic and military ascendancy only intensified the anxieties of her neighbors. In 1913, Germany, second only to America, was the most powerful industrial nation in the world. For the best part of two decades, between 1871 and 1890, the new European status quo was not seriously challenged, thanks to the diplomatic dexterity and deviousness of Otto von Bismarck, the German chancellor, who kept France isolated. When von Bismarck left office in 1890, it was not long before a fresh series of unpredictable currents began to erode the foundation of his carefully constructed continental system. A rapid deterioration in Russo-German relations and a rapprochement between Tsarist Russia and Republican France compelled Germany to strengthen her existing links with the Austro-Hungarian dual monarchy. This alliance ensured that she possessed an ally to the east. Germany would pay a heavy price for a policy that tied her more closely to a dilapidated empire that was itself finding it increasingly difficult to curb the nationalist aspirations of its diverse population. The potentially explosive situation in the Balkans was made more dangerous by the decline of Turkish influence there. In seeking to exploit such opportunities, Austria and Russia each embarked upon a course which could only end in confrontation. The rise of Serbia added yet another hazardous element to an unstable regional mixture. Serbia had been infuriated by Austria's annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1908. In turn, Serbia gained influence and territory as a result of the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 13, giving Austria mounting cause for irritation. With the departure of Bismarck, the belligerent and erratic Wilhelm II, who had become Kaiser in 1888, soon spurred Germany to follow a more aggressive path in international relationships. France, already determined to avenge the disaster of 1870 and win back her lost provinces, was further alarmed by Germany's developing industrial and military muscle. Russia, too, had grounds for concern about the Austro-German alliance that not only threw an ominous shadow along her western frontier, but was likely to counteract Russian interests in the Balkans. The first and probably the most significant crack in the edifice erected by Bismarckian diplomacy came in 1892, the removal of its cornerstone, the isolation of France. That year, Russia and France concluded a military agreement reinforced by additional talks in 1893 and 94, under which each promised to come to the other's aid if either were attacked by Germany. This change from Bismarck's Realpolitik to the Weltpolitik of Kaiser Wilhelm II ultimately forced Britain to review her relations with the other leading players on the European and world stage. Britain was relatively friendly with Germany for much of the last quarter of the 19th century, not the least because Queen Victoria's eldest daughter was married to the German crown prince, Frederick, who succeeded to the imperial throne in March 1888. Frederick died of cancer after reigning for barely three months, and the accession of his estranged son, Wilhelm II, heralded fresh competition with Britain for colonies and overseas markets, as the new Kaiser sought world power status for Germany. His first public words as Kaiser were not to the public, but was addressed to his armies. We belong to each other, I and the army. We were born for each other and will indissolubly cleave to each other. I promise ever to bear in mind that from the world above, the eyes of my forefathers look down on me. 
and that I shall one day have to stand accountable to them for the glory and honor of the army. The German army led by Prussia was the most powerful military organization in the world. But it was Germany's naval expansion which alienated Britain. Our naval power involved British existence. If our naval supremacy were to be impaired, the whole fortunes of our race and empire would perish and be swept utterly away. Shaped by Rear Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz with the Kaiser's support, the Kriegsmarine disclosed its intention to construct a fleet of 38 battleships within 20 years. Regarding Britain as the most dangerous bloc to Germany's growth, Tirpitz envisioned the German fleet as a political pawn which would strengthen his country's hand in world affairs. The launching of 14 battleships in Germany between 1900 and 1905 inaugurated a naval arms race that would enter an even more menacing phase when Britain launched the revolutionary, turbine-driven, all-big-gun battleship HMS Dreadnought in 1906. Each launching drove Germany and England farther apart. I explained to him that the real ground for the growing antagonism in this country towards Germany was not jealousy of her rapidly expanding commerce, but fear of her growing navy. The Kaiser did not care. I do not wish for a good understanding with England at the expense of the extension of the German fleet. German backing for the Boers during the South African War of 1899 to 1902 hastened the demise of Britain's earlier isolationist policy. In 1904, Britain signed the Entente Cordiale, which greatly strengthened the diplomatic and military tie with her traditional rival, France. A similar understanding was reached with Russia in 1907. Thus, before the close of the 19th century, Britain had swung noticeably toward a Franco-Russian alliance. The understandings with France and Russia did not constitute formal agreements, and neither did they commit Britain irrevocably to go to war in support of either power, but she was morally bound to France and Russia against the Central Powers. An unforeseen incident involving one or more of these countries might well ignite a general conflagration which, because of the rival alliance systems, could engulf them all. Sunday, June 28, 1914. Early in the morning, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his consort, Sophie, prayed at mass in a chapel set up for them at their hotel. Leaving the suburban spa, they boarded a train to Sarajevo, a trip of less than half an hour. At the railroad terminal on the outskirts of town, they transferred to a motorcade in which they rode the rest of the way. The procession of chauffeur-driven motor cars entered Sarajevo somewhere between 9.30 and 10 o'clock, heading for the town hall. The morning rain had stopped. The top of the car had been lowered. That morning, Gavrilo Princip, a Bosnian Serb teenager whose career choice was to be a martyr, had stationed himself and his fellow conspirators along the Apple embankment at three places where it was intersected by bridges. The Archduke's motorcade driving along the quay would be running a gauntlet of nationalist assassins. At the first of the bridges, the Archduke's procession entered a kill zone. Three conspirators formed a line along the river side of the quay and two on the land. The first attempt on the Archduke's life came from the riverside, from Nangeliko Kabrinovic, who asked a nearby policeman to point out which was Franz Ferdinand's motor car. Then he knocked the cap off his bomb on a lamppost to detonate it. 
He threw the bomb wildly at the Archduke's motor car, hitting the folded back hood of the convertible, from which it rolled off to explode against a wheel of the car following it. The Countess felt a graze on her neck from the detonator, while the occupants behind received slight wounds. Princip, who had heard the explosion and shouts from the crowd, hurried to the spot where it looked as though all was over. The gendarme had Kabrinovich firmly in custody and were hauling him off to the police station. None of the other conspirators was to be found. Alone, Princip wandered back to what had been his appointed station on the riverside of the Apple Embankment at what was called the Latin Bridge. He then crossed the street. Of the others, one was so jammed in the crowd that he could not pull the bomb out of his pocket. A second saw a policeman standing near him and decided that any movement would be too risky. A third felt sorry for the Archduke's wife and did nothing. A fourth lost his nerve and slipped home. Franz Ferdinand decided to cancel existing plans which called for his motorcade to maneuver through winding alleys on the way to the museum. After a stop at the town hall for a reception and speeches, he insisted on driving to hospital to visit Colonel Marizzi, who'd been lightly wounded in the bombing attack. The driver in the lead car was not told of the change in plans and turned off the main road toward the museum. When the mistake was realized, the Archduke's driver halted his car to consider how best to get back on the route to hospital. Meanwhile, they sat motionless, less than five feet from the dejected Princip. He was astonished at his sudden good fortune. He quickly seized his chance. He reached for a bomb in his pocket, but became aware that, hemmed in by the crowd, he could not swing his arm to toss it at his target. So he pulled out his pistol and fired two shots at point-blank range. His first shot hit the Archduke in the jugular. His second caught the Duchess in the abdomen as she was rising to her husband's aid. Princip then turned the revolver on himself, but was prevented from firing it by a bystander who hurled him to the ground. Confusion erupted as the crowd and nearby police battled one another to get at the boyish assassin. Princip tried once again to kill himself, reaching into his pocket. He removed a capsule and swallowed. The poison was old and only made the assassin vomit when it did not work. The mob closed in about him and began to beat him. Eventually, the police wrestled him away from the crowd. Meanwhile, the limousine fled to seek help. Sophie, dear, Sophie, dear, don't die. Stay alive for our children, Franz Ferdinand called out. And then, more weakly, he repeated over and over, it is nothing, as his aides anxiously asked how he felt. The first shot was fired at about half past ten. Sophie died at roughly 10.45. The Archduke, around 11 o'clock. It was not nothing. Had the murders in Sarajevo been committed even a century earlier, it would have taken weeks or months for word of it to reach faraway places. The consequences might have been far different, but technology had changed all that. The foreign officers of the world knew of the shooting at once. In Germany, the Kaiser was informed while racing in a regatta aboard his yacht, Meteor. Wilhelm decided to return to Berlin. In England, the outrage, as the assassinations were called, dominated the foreign reporting published in the morning's London Times. In France, at the first cabinet meeting since the assassinations, the killings were hardly mentioned. Indeed, in all the capitals of Europe, the reaction to the assassination of the heir to the Habsburg throne was calm to the point of indifference. The truth of the matter was that few in Austria-Hungary were sorry that Franz Ferdinand had been removed from the scene. True, the leaders of the dual monarchy deplored the killing of royalty, but if someone of the blood had to be sacrificed, the Archduke was everybody's choice to be the one. Of course, the heir apparent was next only to the emperor, the most important figure in the Habsburg Empire. In murdering him, upstart Serbian terrorists threw down a public challenge to the very existence of the empire. If Vienna failed to respond, it would lose by default. 
But that was not the reason that the dual monarchy sought to destroy Serbia. The Habsburgs wanted to destroy Serbia before the assassination. The killings gave Vienna an excuse, not the reason for snuffing out Serbia's challenge to Austro-Hungarian authority in the Balkans. First, Austria sought Germany's backing. In turn, it saw in the Austro-Serbian confrontation a golden chance of securing hegemony in Europe, achieving world status while splitting the encircling Entente powers, forestalling Russian modernization and eradicating the dangers of Austria-Hungary. The Kaiser believed that, as in the past, they could keep this conflict local without going to war with other powers. The German ambassador to the dual monarchy reported to the Kaiser. Count Berthold, the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, told me today that everything pointed to the fact that the threads of the conspiracy to which the Archduke fell a sacrifice ran together at Belgrade. I frequently hear expressed in Vienna, even among serious people, the wish that at last a final and fundamental reckoning should be had with the Serbs. <laughs> The Kaiser noted in the margin of his copy of the report, now or never. Four days later, on July 6th, he sent a message to the Austrian Emperor. The Emperor Franz Josef may rest assured that His Majesty will faithfully stand by Austria-Hungary, as is required by the obligations of his alliance and of his ancient friendship. And with that, on the same day, the Kaiser went back on a summer cruise on the royal yacht in Scandinavian waters. As Europe continued its perfect summer vacation, Austria went off to cash Germany's blank check for unconditional support against Serbia. Having obtained Germany's endorsement 25 days after the Archduke's assassination, Austria issued a 10-point ultimatum to Serbia. Germany's leading military figures had been on leave in July, as had the Kaiser, the Chancellor, and the Foreign Secretary. After the Austrians had set a fixed date for their ultimatum, Berlin quietly signaled its leaders to return. They did so from July 23rd onward, returning singly so as not to create an uproar. Then they began to debate what to do next. Germany's overlapping army leaders, Chief of Staff von Moltke, War Minister von Falkenhayn, and Military Cabinet Chief von Linke were among the several key officials debating the issues of war and peace after the return from vacation. For Moltke, the arguments were particularly frustrating, in part because civilian leaders shared neither his point of view nor his objectives, and in part because they did not know what he knew. A Saxon officer who spoke with Moltke's deputy on July 23 reported that he received the impression that the great general staff would be pleased if war were to come about now. Von Moltke did not fear Russian mobilization. He devoutly desired it. But Moltke was uniquely aware that time was running out for his country. Germany was committed to follow von Moltke's own grand strategy, a strategy few were aware of. The Kaiser, Falkenhayn, and, until July 31, the German Chancellor, Bettmann, were among those in the dark. None of them knew that Moltke had already put his plan for his opening moves in the war into motion. On 25 July, Serbia accepted nine of the points, but rejected, in part, the demand that Austrian officials be involved in the investigation of the assassination, regarding such interference as a challenge to its sovereignty. On 25 July, Serbia also mobilized her army. Russia, too, confirmed partial mobilization before entering a period preparatory to war on 26 July. Austria reciprocated by mobilizing the same day. Then, on 28 July, the dual monarchy declared war on Serbia. 
Up to this point, it might still have been possible to isolate the problem, but Germany continued to act in an uncompromising manner to heighten tensions and gave the crisis an international dimension. On 29 July, Germany demanded an immediate cessation of Russian preparations. Failing to do so would mean that Germany would mobilize her army. The German Imperial Chancellor, Theobald von bettmann holweg instructed the ambassador in St. Petersburg. Kindly call attention to the fact that further confirmation of Russia's mobilization measures would force us to mobilize. And in that case, a European war could scarcely be prevented. Russia could not afford to acquiesce meekly on the destruction of Serbian sovereignty or increased Austrian influence in Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Consequently, on 30 July, Russia ordered a general mobilization in support of Serbia. Russian mobilization began the following day, but was not the inevitable precursor to war. Her forces could, if necessary, have stayed on their own territory for weeks while negotiations proceeded. The actions of Germany heightened the tension. At 1.45 p.m. on 31 July, Germany proclaims a Kriegsgefahrstein, or threatening danger of war. 3.30 p.m., the German government addresses Russia and France. Germany presents Russia with an ultimatum. Unless she demobilizes within 12 hours, full mobilization in Germany will follow. The German ambassador in Paris is told mobilization means war. France is asked for guarantees of neutrality. Events were rapidly moving out of control. When Russia failed to respond, Germany ordered a general mobilization. Time was running out. Mobilization in each country was the moment when a war plan took effect. Nowhere was this clearer than in Germany, since Germany had become a prisoner of her own plan. The Schlieffen Plan had been originally shaped in 1897 and revised in 1905 by Count Alfred von Schlieffen, then chief of the German general staff. Schlieffen's overriding aim had been to enable Germany to deal successfully with the strategic nightmare of a two-front war against Russia and France. However, by appearing to offer a feasible solution to this problem, the plan reduced the army's fears of a two-front war and strengthened its willingness to accept the risks of such a conflict. Schlieffen estimated that should Germany have to face both France and Russia, the latter would be slower to mobilize and deploy, giving Germany a vital margin of some six weeks in which to overpower France by means of a massive and rapid campaign. As soon as France was defeated, Germany could then transfer the bulk of her forces to the east to meet the Russian steamroller. There was a danger, nonetheless, that the fortresses along France's northeastern frontier might fatally delay the German army's lightning western offensive. Accordingly, Schlieffen resolved that German forces must cross a narrow strip of Dutch territory known as the Maastricht Appendix then sweep through Belgium, trampling neutrality before driving into northwestern France. The pivotal role was given to five armies deployed by Metz and Holland, totaling 35 corps in all. The most powerful forces were allocated to the extreme right wing of the offensive. One army here was expected to swing round to west of Paris on the outer flank of a colossal wheeling movement which was intended to take the opposing French armies in the rear before trapping them against their own frontier. Colonel General Helmut von Molke, Schlieffen's successor, made several key alterations to his original plan between 1906 and 1914. Though a diligent and painstaking officer, Moltke was also introspective and suffered from bouts of low self-confidence. He weakened the right flank and abandoned the planned move through Holland. These decisions would prove to be unfortunate. On 1 August, Germany could wait no longer for an answer from the Tsar and declared war on Russia. Honoring her agreement with Russia, France mobilized and set in motion the remaining cogs in the intricate machinery of European alliances. On 2 August, 
Germany handed Belgium an ultimatum insisting on the right of passage through her territory. The Belgians took less time to deliver a sharp no. The next day, Germany declared war on France. The French declaration of war quickly followed. Early on 4 August, German forces crossed the frontier into Belgium. The strength of the German armies on this flank was impressive. Colonel General Alexander von Kluck's first army on the extreme right numbered 320,000 troops. The neighboring second army under Colonel General Karl von Buelow and the third army commanded by General Max von Hausen respectively totaled 260,000 and 180,000. The invasion of Belgian territory brought the final major player into the conflict, Great Britain. I ask the House, from the point of view of British interests, to consider what may be at stake. If France is beaten to her knees, if in a crisis like this we run away from obligations of honor and interest as regards the Belgian treaty, we should, I believe, sacrifice our respect and good name and reputation before the world and should not escape the most serious and grave economic consequences. God grant we may not have a European war thrust upon us, and for such a stupid reason too. No, I don't mean stupid, but to have to go to war on account of tiresome Serbia, beggar's belief. Britain had no formal agreement with France and Russia, but was committed in principle by a treaty concluded in 1839 to guarantee Belgian neutrality. The hour had struck. At 11 p.m. on 4 August, time ran out for the last summer of the old world. Standing on the balcony at his residence, British Home Secretary Sir Edward Grey watched the lamplighters move along the street below. The lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Had the murders in Sarajevo been committed even a century earlier, it would have taken weeks or months for word of it to reach faraway places. The consequences might have been far different, but technology had changed all that. The foreign officers of the world knew of the shooting at once. In Germany, the Kaiser was informed while racing in a regatta aboard his yacht, Meteor. Wilhelm decided to return to Berlin. In England, the outrage, as the assassinations were called, dominated the foreign reporting published in the morning's London Times. In France, at the first cabinet meeting since the assassinations, the killings were hardly mentioned. Indeed, in all the capitals of Europe, the reaction to the assassination of the heir to the Habsburg throne was calm to the point of indifference. The truth of the matter was that few in Austria-Hungary were sorry that Franz Ferdinand had been removed from the scene. True, the leaders of the dual monarchy deplored the killing of royalty, but if someone of the blood had to be sacrificed, the Archduke was everybody's choice to be the one. Of course, the heir apparent was next only to the Emperor, the most important figure in the Habsburg Empire. In murdering him, upstart Serbian terrorists threw down a public challenge to the very existence of the empire. If Vienna failed to respond, it would lose by default. 
But that was not the reason that the dual monarchy sought to destroy Serbia. The Habsburgs wanted to destroy Serbia before the assassination. The killings gave Vienna an excuse, not the reason for snuffing out Serbia's challenge to Austro-Hungarian authority in the Balkans. First, Austria sought Germany's backing. In turn, it saw in the Austro-Serbian confrontation a golden chance of securing hegemony in Europe, achieving world status while splitting the encircling Entente powers, forestalling Russian modernization and eradicating the dangers of Austria-Hungary. The Kaiser believed that, as in the past, they could keep this conflict local without going to war with other powers. The German ambassador to the dual monarchy reported to the Kaiser. Count Berthold, the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, told me today that everything pointed to the fact that the threads of the conspiracy to which the Archduke fell a sacrifice ran together at Belgrade. I frequently hear expressed in Vienna, even among serious people, the wish that at last a final and fundamental reckoning should be had with the Serbs. <laughs> The Kaiser noted in the margin of his copy of the report, now or never. Four days later, on July 6th, he sent a message to the Austrian Emperor. The Emperor Franz Josef may rest assured that His Majesty will faithfully stand by Austria-Hungary, as is required by the obligations of his alliance and of his ancient friendship. And with that, on the same day, the Kaiser went back on a summer cruise on the royal yacht in Scandinavian waters. As Europe continued its perfect summer vacation, Austria went off to cash Germany's blank check for unconditional support against Serbia. Having obtained Germany's endorsement 25 days after the Archduke's assassination, Austria issued a 10-point ultimatum to Serbia. Germany's leading military figures had been on leave in July, as had the Kaiser, the Chancellor, and the Foreign Secretary. After the Austrians had set a fixed date for their ultimatum, Berlin quietly signaled its leaders to return. They did so from July 23rd onward, returning singly so as not to create an uproar. Then they began to debate what to do next. Germany's overlapping army leaders, Chief of Staff von Moltke, War Minister von Falkenhayn, and Military Cabinet Chief von Linke were among the several key officials debating the issues of war and peace after the return from vacation. For Moltke, the arguments were particularly frustrating, in part because civilian leaders shared neither his point of view nor his objectives, and in part because they did not know what he knew. A Saxon officer who spoke with Moltke's deputy on July 23 reported that he received the impression that the great general staff would be pleased if war were to come about now. Von Moltke did not fear Russian mobilization. He devoutly desired it. But Moltke was uniquely aware that time was running out for his country. Germany was committed to follow von Moltke's own grand strategy, a strategy few were aware of. The Kaiser, Falkenhayn, and, until July 31, the German Chancellor, Bettmann, were among those in the dark. None of them knew that Moltke had already put his plan for his opening moves in the war into motion. On 25 July, Serbia accepted nine of the points, but rejected, in part, the demand that Austrian officials be involved in the investigation of the assassination, regarding such interference as a challenge to its sovereignty. On 25 July, Serbia also mobilized her army. Russia, too, confirmed partial mobilization before entering a period preparatory to war on 26 July. Austria reciprocated by mobilizing the same day. Then, on 28 July, the dual monarchy declared war on Serbia. 
Up to this point, it might still have been possible to isolate the problem, but Germany continued to act in an uncompromising manner to heighten tensions and gave the crisis an international dimension. On 29 July, Germany demanded an immediate cessation of Russian preparations. Failing to do so would mean that Germany would mobilize her army. The German Imperial Chancellor, Theobald von bettmann holweg instructed the ambassador in St. Petersburg. Kindly call attention to the fact that further confirmation of Russia's mobilization measures would force us to mobilize. And in that case, a European war could scarcely be prevented. <laughs> 